Good evening. It's really nice to see everybody here this evening. I think we'll be in for a very fun conversation, and I do hope that everybody here feels that they can be a part of that conversation and will join in. You can interrupt me anytime you'd like. Um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that for the artists. They can say that for themselves. But then after, after the artists, each each artist will speak briefly about his or her work, his and her work, and then after that we'll just have a, a little moment for a conversation. We have the chairs set up over there so it's like a little talk show. Um, I thought for a little while we would maybe just do two chairs and just have Will and Rachel, but that seemed a little, you know, they needed a catalyst, so I'll be the, I'll be the decorative embellishment and the catalyst uh, uh, as, well as, as well as I can be decorative. Um, many of you have come to our artist forums before. It's uh, a standard feature offered by our education uh, department. And the artist forums have in the past really pretty much concentrated on artists from the middle Tennessee area. So we're really lucky and happy to be able to change that around a little bit. It's always fun to offer something new and different, and especially when it has to do with installations that are here at the Frisch Center that I hope everybody has had a chance to see. They're really both uh, quite remarkable, delightful, exhilarating, um, and I can come up with a bunch of other adjectives, but you can fill in your own as you go. And if you haven't seen the work, certainly before you leave tonight, you can make a quick uh, uh, circumferent walk around the building and, and see the whole thing. Um, each of the artists here does have some sort of connection with Middle Tennessee, and I, I struggled very hard to find even a, the, the most remote connection. Um, in the case of Will Ryman, of course, his father is a native of Nashville, and he does have family, some of whom are with us tonight, uh, still in the area, so that's, that's a nice connection. Uh, Rachel, it's a little bit looser, um, a native of, of Atlanta. She moved as a child to Missouri, and, and we were thinking that the truck probably stopped in Nashville on the way here. We don't, we don't, <laughs> we don't know that for sure, but she, uh, she um, has family in Sewanee, which is on the outskirts of Nashville, isn't it? Something like that. So we're claiming them. Anyway, we're claiming them as Middle Tennesseans. Uh, before speaking more about our speakers and introducing our speakers, I would like to say a little bit about about our program of installing art outside the building. This really was inspired by our director, Susan Edwards, who's only been here nine years. But when she got here, she came from the Katona Museum, where they had a very active and dynamic program of installing, of, of making temporary installations of sculpture. And Susan has always said that nothing says art center like having art on the outside of the building. And I think that that's a great philosophy, and it really has borne out uh, for us in the past, uh, uh, in the past five or six years. We've had works by George, several works by George Rickey, by Boaz Vadia, by Fletcher Benton. And it's really exciting and wonderful to be able to change things out every couple of years. And we do have, have them on loan. It's kind of like a quasi-permanent collection. We, when we installed George Rickey's Three Red Lines, uh, that was the moment when we got a group together, the uh, Friends of Sculpture, that helped us, uh, help sponsor that installation. And we do have some members of the Friends of Sculpture here with us tonight. And we're very, very grateful to them for the support that they've given to us in the past. We also would like to welcome the Frist Center Circle members and members of our Board of Trustees who are here tonight. It's not always easy to find appropriate works for long-term loans, for loans of a year to 18 months. They can be permanently installed somewhere. People aren't ready to just you know, pluck them up off their, off their yards and send them to us. Uh, the logistics can be very, very tricky. We spend a lot of time looking and working hard to find sculptures that would be interesting to people, that would, that would really animate the, the, the uh, front and rear facades of our building. We really hadn't thought to look at a most logical place, which is the temporary art programs of other cities. And it just so happens that the speakers tonight and the artists tonight were both featured in the New York City Parks Department uh, public arts program. So that's, uh, we're, we're hoping that we can strike up a relationship with New York and maybe, maybe we'll have more to come. All this was really initiated, I think, when uh, Susan and I saw Will Ryman's work on Park Avenue, the, the wonderful installation of the Roses on Park Avenue in New York, which was in 2010. Oh, okay. Well, it just seems like... 
Yeah, okay, seems like longer ago than that. Um, but uh, so we saw this and we saw what, what these wonderful roses, these oversized, gigantic, spectacular roses did to change the cityscape. And we saw the kind of impact that they had in New York on a very, very busy street in New York and thought, well, you know, we need some kind of impact like that on our own very busy street of Broadway. What are people gonna see? What's gonna really change the face of the building? And so we were very, very happy when Will in his gallery, the Paul Kasman Gallery, agreed to work out the loan of his rose, the 65th Street rose uh, that we have had on view for uh, about a year, close to a year. And then with Rachel Owens' work, I received an invitation from her dealer, Andrea Zeher, and Scott Zeher, her two dealers, to do a studio visit to see a work which, like Will's, was being made for the Parks Department. We went out to see it during a late October blizzard. It was really amazing. It was just before Halloween and it's not supposed to snow. But we went out to the, to the Brooklyn waterfront to see this wonderful sculpture. And I wasn't really worried about it because I knew that at least the studio would be warm. But of course, as you know when you see the sculpture, it's too big to fit in the studio. So actually the sculpture was being made in this kind of elevated area outside of the studio, outside of the warehouse, and the cold wind was whipping in, and I, and I said to myself, okay, I'm gonna love it or I'm gonna leave it, but whatever I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do it fast. <laughs> well, as it turned out, we spent about an hour looking at the sculpture, really looking at the sculpture, and it was not finished. It was in, a, in kind of a halfway state. It wasn't painted, the sound wasn't there, but as Rachel talked about it and talked about the military Humvee and the, the, the imagery associated and, and, and kind of the meaning of the Humvee and the meaning of the whales, and it became more and more interesting to me and more and more compelling to me. Now this was a raw piece. This was rough. And it, it took an act of the imagination to try to envision what it was going to look like and what it would look like here. And so fortunately, about a year ago, I was able to go to New York and see the work installed on the Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza opposite uh, the street from the United Nations. And they, 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 uh, Rachel will talk about this uh, uh, quite a bit. The plaza is a really dynamic, social, interactive space. And to see the work there in this pristine white and the sound, the mournful sound of the whales coming through, I just knew that this was really right for us. This, this had power, this had intrigue, it was, it, was, it was compelling, it was extraordinary. So we were really happy that, uh, that uh, Rachel and Andrea and Scott were able to work out this loan. Now just, uh, I will introduce our guests one at a time. Will Ryman will speak first. Will was born in New York City to a very artistic family. His parents are both artists and his two brothers are both artists. Um, I think that that may have had something to do with the fact that when he decided what he was gonna be, that it wasn't gonna be an artist. He decided he would be a writer, a playwright, and he worked at that for a while. But I think that, you know, sometimes genetics and the environment, they just, you just can't buck it, you know? It's just, it is what it is. So uh, he, he found his way to the visual art world, and since 2001 has been making wonderful sculptures and has exhibited at the, he was uh, represented by the Marlboro Gallery before the Kasman Gallery, and has exhibited widely throughout Throughout New York, he's exhibited in Munich in, in a gallery. His current show is called America. It's at the Paul Kasman Gallery in New York, and, and I think you'll talk a little bit about that. Um, really wonderful, really worth seeing. So we're, we're, we're absolutely happy to have Will here. He's been in museum shows at the National Academy of Design at, at 21C Museum just up the road in Louisville. The roses were installed at the Fairchild Tropical Gardens in South Florida last year, and it was really interesting to see how they change, how the context of a, of a work of public art changes when you move it from a very urban environment to this incredible, lush, tropical environment. I mean, the, the, the works were spectacular in each place, but spectacular for different reasons, which I think is, was, was extraordinarily compelling. He also has sculptures in many, public, or many collections, including the Margulies Collection and the Saatchi Collection in London. So uh, please join me in welcoming Will Ryman. And, uh, and Will? Hi. <clears throat> so I'm Will Ryman, and I, I live in New York. And um, uh, I've been making sculpture, sculptures for about 10 years. And, um, I think as, as far as sculptures, sculptors go, 
10 years is, is really an infant stage to an artist's life. I think that um, uh, most artists, I guess not all, but most artists, I think do their most serious work after about 15, 20 years. Uh, so I'm really um, just starting to scratch the surface in my work. And um, uh, so I guess you're kind of listening to an infant talk about his art right now. And um, in, in the very beginning, I did mostly figures and figurative installations. And <clears throat> I used materials that I thought would best express my interest at the time, which uh, my interest at the time was the human condition, um, uh, trying to find beauty in the grotesque, beauty in ugliness, trying to find humor in tragedy, contradictions, contradictions of the human condition. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll take you through some pictures of my early work all the way up till now. I'll tell you about what I was thinking about while making them, and uh, that'll be that. So the, the, first, uh, the first slide I want to show you is the, it's actually the very first sculpture I ever did. It's a self-portrait, and um, it is probably the only one I ever made that really sort of resembles a human. And <clears throat> when I did this, I was really more, mostly focused on, on the technical investigation of the human body, the scale from the head to the body, the arms to the legs. It's made from uh, ma mainly junk, recycled bottles, buttons, uh, plaster. Uh, there's some rope in there, which you can't see. It's all buried within the, the piece. And um, probably the, the this is the piece I enjoyed least of making it because it was, like I said, mainly a technical uh, exploration of the, the, the human body, my body, which wasn't that interesting to me. But <laughs> I'm more interested in, in sort of what's real, not what, sort of what's unreal, not what's so real. Anyway, uh, the next slide is, is my first uh, figurative installation that I made. It's called The Pit. And uh, this piece, uh, it's a terrible photo, but um, this piece, the idea here was basically uh, that everything on the surface is perfect. And on the inside, it's, it's messy, ugly, and disturbing. And what it is, it's, a, it's a, a white box that I made that's about 12 feet high. So the viewer entered into the gallery and saw this perfectly crafted, seamless white cube referencing uh, modern architecture and minimalism, a movement that I grew up in. And you walk up the stairs on the side here that I built and onto a balcony that I built. And you look inside and you see 90 figurative objects um, that are uh, made of, of junk, recycled bottles and, and, and paper that I pulverized. And they're all wearing children's shoes, old, old shoes that, that I found out of dumpsters in the Salvation Army. Dumpsters are my friend. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and when I was making this piece, I was thinking of angst and oppression, um, sweatshops, global exploitation. So the next piece I want to show is probably my favorite figure that I ever made. It never. Um, it never left my studio. And uh, I also made this from found objects uh, that I actually found in the street, electrical cord, burlap, uh, expansion foam. And what I wanted to do here was, or what I was thinking about was the, uh, the contrast between savage and civilized man. And, um, um, while making this piece, I started for the first time to sort of think about the relationship between abstraction and realism. And that started to excite me. It also reminds me of the painting that uh, Goya did of um, Saturn devouring his children. This is a piece that also never left my studio. Uh, it's an installation piece, um, untitled. It is a uh, hundred... Uh, little figurative businessmen-like figures, uh, about eight inches tall, made from pins and nails and screws and plumber's putty and 
uh, paper and anything I could find really and it was inspired by uh, the, the financial collapse when Lehman Brothers collapsed in 2008. I remember feeling angry as anyone was and I was trying to find uh, humor and catastrophe and the idea I had was I <clears throat> had these little figures in the back of my studio in a dark room and I remember uh, uh, growing up, going into the kitchen late at night, turning the lights on and seeing roaches kind of crawl and run around. And that was the inspiration for this. And I uh, found a lot of humor in it and it made me feel better about what was going on in the world when the world economy was teetering. The uh, final figurative installation I'll show is, is the bed, which is probably my favorite of my installations, that, the figurative installations. This is a, a, another self-portrait um, uh, of a man on his bed, collapsed. And the, the figure itself is um, deflated, almost like a, like a balloon that's deflated out of air, which, which was referencing uh, uh, struggle. Um, the Ballantine beer cans are an obvious reference to uh, Jasper Johns. And I made this out of cardboard boxes um, steel, um, paper, plastic, garbage, junk, anything I could find. This is at the Saatchi Gallery right now. And it's big. It's big. And, and in the photo you don't see it, but I made a portrait of my dog uh, who was in the bed with the figure. Uh, but you can't see it in this photo. Shortly after I finished this piece, I started, my interest started to shift from the human condition to, to uh, uh, global symbols and the effects that global symbols have on our culture. And um, that uh, led to the uh, first public installation I did, which was called The Roses, which Mark spoke about. And there's actually one that was on 65th Street right outside the museum. And the idea, uh, <clears throat> my idea was that, or my suspicion was, that if, if, if you change the meaning of a global symbol, like a rose, um, perhaps that might change the meaning of a culture, like Park Avenue. So um, this is an overview shot, 10 blocks, from 57th Street to 67th Street in the wintertime, which was very uh, important to me to have this up in the wintertime, because that was the, the contrast I wanted to have, these objects in the middle of the snow. Um, and I was, the idea stemmed from, you know, Park Avenue symbolizes a lot. It symbolizes the elite, uh, the sophisticated, the super successful, top of the pyramid. And roses symbolize a lot globally. Obviously romance, but it symbolizes the elite as well. Also the sophisticated, the celebration. And my idea was if I made these roses 30 feet tall out of steel, absurd looking, cartoonish, cover them with cartoonish bugs, um, change, change the meaning of, of the rose altogether, put that on Park Avenue, um, hopefully that would make Park Avenue more approachable for the layman like me and, and change the whole experience of the area. That was the idea. What ended up on the street is very different. This is the piece out in front of the museum. What ended up on the street was very different than what I had intended, um, but uh, I was still happy with it. And what I did notice um, during the installation was that uh, it did kind of change the whole experience of Park Avenue, um, in my opinion. A lot of people that otherwise would not have gone there went there, I think. Um, and the whole area was, was more uh, approachable, I want to say. Um, this is uh, a piece that I tried to reverse the dollar sign. <laughs> My favorite was when they were in the snow. Uh, when it was in the springtime, it wasn't as strong for me. This is 58th Street. That's 61st Street. 67th Street. That was my first attempt at an outdoor sculpture too, um, which I would probably make some changes if, if I could do it over. 
So after, um, after this show was over, I went back to my studio, and <clears throat> I think a lot of artists do this, at least I do it. After a big project, I always go and I, I, I like to clean my studio, and that helps me kind of think about things. And I remember while I was cleaning them, my, my, my studio, I, uh, I had hundreds of these chip brushes, which are little inexpensive paint brushes that you get at any store. And I, was, I had hundreds of them from, from painting the roses. And I was cleaning the tables off in my studio, which were covered with these brushes, and I was stacking them off to the side. And pretty quickly, I started to, to realize that the, the shape that the brushes were forming, I thought was interesting. So my interest started to shift again from global symbols and the human condition to the meaning of objects. And it was, an ex it was very exciting for me at the time. I started stacking as many as I could up on, on top of each other and they were starting to, to form these shapes and uh, to where I couldn't even see the brush anymore. And <clears throat> That's what started this installation called Brushes that I made. Um, and I, made, I took 300,000 of these chip brushes and uh, made these caverns. And right here, I, I was kind of starting to see connections throughout my work of contrast. One side of these caverns was soft and spongy. The other side was hard and, and, and um, organic like coral in the ocean. I started doing the same thing with nails. I made a little maquette bird out of store-bought nails and I thought well why don't I not only use the original object in abundance but why don't I change the scale of these nails and see how far that could, that could go. And so I made a, uh, a bird out of um, 300,000 nails that were store-bought and, and uh, I changed the scale by fabricating the rest of the nails. And this <coughs> um, started to interest me more about the negotiation between abstraction and realism. If you walk around the bird in the back, you see this um, massive amount of, of nail-like objects coming at you in different scales. If you step back and walk around, those objects form the image of this bird, which it, I'm installing this in front of the Flatiron Building on Sunday of this week, and then uh, Monday's the blue rib, the, 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 um, the, 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 the ribbon cutting ceremony. <laughs> uh, So <clears throat> there, are, there are a couple of transitions. There's the human condition, the contrast, and the contradictions within the human condition. There's global symbols, the contradiction and the contrast of changing the meaning of global symbols, changing a culture. And then there's changing the meaning of an object, which led me to my current show right now, which is at Paul Kasman Gallery. It's what I'm most excited about now, and this is what I mean when I say I'm scratching the surface um, of my own work. Uh, I think a lot of, well anyway, I won't bore you with that, but, but uh, uh, this is an appropriation of Abraham Lincoln's boyhood cabin where he was born. Um, it's made from real logs. Uh, it's a real cabin, you can live in it. Uh, it's, it's coated in, in a gold resin that I made in my shop. I added a lot of gold pigment to some uh, very liquid resin, almost like a nail polish, and coated it with that. Um, the interior of the cabin is made up of uh, uh, objects that, that show the, uh, the arc and the growth of the United States economy, beginning from the African slave trade, to the agricultural, agriculture, to um, electricity and communications, telephone, to uh, the industrial boom, right on till present day now where we're living right in the middle of the internet boom, which I think is very exciting. We're in the middle of a 
huge advancement in communications and culture. So that's what I'm excited about now. But this interior is made up of all these objects that represent that. This is a photo of the back wall in the cabin taken um, from just outside the door. Um, the, this, this is Native American arrowheads. My hand is shaking because I'm nervous. <laughs> this is corn, cotton, tobacco, cigarettes, arranged in geometric shapes, railroad parts, railroad ties for the railroad industry, also arranged in geometric shapes, gas caps, the auto industry, arranged in triangles, rectangles, line segments, all referencing geometry and mathematics, candy, fast food industry, right here, in lines, going from left to right, telephone cord, communications again. <laughs> My hand is bouncing around. <laughs> um, pharmaceuticals, all the pills in my medicine cabinet. Um, soda and beer can tabs above that, also arranged in geometric shapes. Coal is on top, that's real coal that I mixed with resin so that the resin would attach it to the back wall. That, the coal, incidentally, is the only um, material that's not in chronological order of the growth of the economy from inception till now. I did that for aesthetic reasons. I didn't want a black stripe going down the center of the wall. <clears throat> this is a detailed shot of that back wall. All the objects I just described. My favorite is the phone cord. I was thinking of Egyptian tombs, hieroglyphics, mathematics, globalization. A corner detail of the cabin. The fireplace is made of iPhones, iPads, and iPad nanos. They're not real, by the way. They're, <laughs> they're fakes. Um, everything arranged in, in triangles all around the cabin as well, because um, um, I was thinking about the, the pyramid, and I was thinking about um, um, modern art and the art market. Another detail of the of the fireplace. And as I noticed while I was preparing for this talk, um, these, are, these are cigarettes, railroad ties. Up here is Indian arrowheads. But what I noticed, these are, the, this is the floor foundation, is uh, uh, chain and shackles. Um, what, I was, what I noticed when I was preparing for this talk was that um, um, <clears throat> the, the, accumulate, the, the abundance of one material, changing the meaning of that material, creating something that I find almost fascinating. It becomes an organic, moving uh, entity. These are my favorite, it looks like seashells or something. But anyway, um, um, this is basically what I've been up to the last 10 years. And uh, this is up now. This show is up now uh, for another week. And uh, I've, who knows if I have other transitions coming, but um, I'm very excited about this. Oh, I forgot about this. <laughs> I was, I was about to stop. Um, this is also in the same show. It is a, uh, uh, I, I made this with the leftover materials from the cabin. Um, it's my version of the American flag. It is made up, uh, I tried to take away all the emotion and nationalism and patriotism out of the, flat, the existing flag, the stars, the stripes, and I made it out of objects that uh, really make up the American economy. At the bottom here is Indian arrowheads, chains, Civil War bullets uh, covered with red paint to reference the uh, significance of that war and also the bloodiness of that war. Coal, corn, tobacco, railroad, uh, spark, plugs, spark plugs from a car, 
telephone cord, candy, pharmaceuticals, computer buttons, and these are bullets that um, were used in, in all of the uh, wars that the U.S. has been involved in uh, that I could find. Um, and it, I wanted it to create like a, like a movement. And you can't see it by the photograph, but it looks like hair almost in person, hair on an animal's skin. But anyway, so that's it. That's what I've been up to, and thank you. I think it's just great to see that transition. Very interesting to see the movement toward actually kind of a more formal vocabulary at the same time it's a more symbolic vocabulary. So hopefully we can chat about that a little bit as, uh, as uh, after um, Rachel speaks. Uh, let me introduce Rachel Owens to you. Rachel lives in Brooklyn and as I said before is represented by Z. Her Smith Gallery in New York. Uh, some of you may know Z. Her Smith because uh, they have opened a pop-up gallery here in Nashville for the past couple of years in, in August. Um, very exciting and kind of a cool thing. And there is a new pop-up over at uh, in Cummins Station right now that will open tomorrow featuring smaller works by Rachel. These works were inspired by her personal and I hope you can um, forgive my intrusion into your personal life, but rather traumatic experience with Hurricane Sandy, which hit her Red Hook neighborhood and her home with particular force. It's, it's a very compelling exhibition over there, and I do hope you have a chance to pop over. I think it's up for a couple of weeks. Rachel is a graduate of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the University of Kansas, and the Tyler School of Art in Rome. She's exhibited her work widely, including another large-scale installation at Socrates Park. I saw the slide of it, so I know you're gonna talk about that. Um, I don't know what it says about Rachel or the curators who are drawn to her work, but I just thought I would um, finish my introduction by listing some of the exhibition titles that she's been in. These titles are just too cool not to mention. Evading Customs, Milan. Knock, knock, who's there? That joke isn't funny anymore, in New York. Ionesco's Friends, in Turin. No Apology for Breathing, at Jack the Pelican, in Brooklyn. The Hissing of Summer Lawns, and Andy Warhol's Living Room, in Watermill, New York. And Falling in Love with, Jew with the Jailer's Daughter, at Project Green, in Brooklyn, New York. So highly, I, I think the the patent absurdity of it all is, is spoken about by those titles and probably makes you two pretty well suited to talk to one another after, after you're done with your presentation. So Rachel Owens. Hi. Um, we have to do a little computer switch up here, so bear with us. Um, I guess I just want to start by saying, you know, I do live in Brooklyn. I was actually born in Atlanta. Um, I do have family in Tennessee. Um, other half of my family lives in Kansas City, so a little all over the place. Um, I'm actually going to start, oh, we're having all kinds of cord issues. Um, I'm going to start actually in, in 2007, um, which is not the first thing I made, but it is the first big public sculpture that I made. Um, and it was at Socrates Sculpture Park, again. Um, which some of you may know, some of you, most of you probably don't know. It's um, it was a sculpture park, um, and you get to see my you get to see my my whole laptop screensaver. Um, it was a sculpture park started by Marc de Suvereau, um in the 80s that was built on actually a landfill, um, and it's it is a place in New York where many emerging artists um, are able to um, really kind of make big outdoor sculptures for the first time um, with support and actually um, help there. You get a residency for about three months. So um, this, this piece is called Groundswell, um, and it was based on um, the fact that it was a landfill. Um, so all of these items, this big sort of pipe tree, um, these barrels, these tires are sort of erupting out of the ground. Um, it's also a fountain, um, so there's constantly water coming out of, as if a kind of water main has pumped up out of the ground, and it's constantly recycling through this oil barrel. 
Um, ironically, this is in a private collection now um, in Palm Beach, Florida. So instead of being on a landfill, it's on the intercoastal waterway. Uh, I, I sort of love that. I think it's sort of funny. Um, which is actually another interesting thing because that's happened a lot in my work that there'll be this sort of uh, some kind of sort of political sort of commentary that's about consumption. Um, and, and, and it is sort of a problematic thing potentially about what happens to our work when it goes from a public space into a private collection. Um, but I've always sort of chosen to um, like that tension in a certain way. Um, <laughs> call that what you will. Um, all right, this is the next, uh, this was actually, I stayed at Socrates. I enjoyed working there so much. And they let me um, make this piece, which was called Wishing Well, um, which went on to be at an art fair in Miami um, during Art Basel. This is at the Nada Fair. Um, you can see the bird theme. Um, this is sort of the last of the birds. Um, but this is a big oil derrick type shape. Um, another fountain piece, as if these barrels have come in and sort of exploded and lodged into this thing, and there's water really gushing through um, through the whole structure. That siren is turning, um, sort of a apocalyptic kind of beacon piece. But again, it's a fountain, which is like this, you know, very ubiquitous sculptural form all around the world. Um, and you could actually throw money into it. Um, and I've shown it twice, actually. And both times I took all the money and gave it, um, which granted wasn't that much. It was like $10 um, and, and nickels and dimes. Um, but did donate it to some of my favorite little charities in Brooklyn. Um, this is the show Harboring, which was at Zier Smith. Um, I'm going to go pretty quickly here and just kind of talk. Actually, where are my notes? I'm sorry. Um, Again, materials are super important. Um, the materials have always had another life. Um, and in their other life, there is meaning. Um, so that meaning comes into the content of the work. Um, I always like to say um, that what the work is made of is what the work is, is what the work is about. Um, these things cannot be separated from one another. They are in a relationship. Um, just going to kind of keep going through. The repurposed or reused materials are chosen because of that former life. That former life becomes part of the relationship and therefore part of the content. Um, this is a self-portrait. Um, this is a sh piece called The Takedown. Trophy. I was using crutches as figures a lot at this point. I had had some health problems and almost cut a couple of my fingers off in the studio, so I think I was conscious of my own body. Um, <laughs> again, and then mixing these sort of um, items and materials that are um, like the oil can that's very beat up with these other items that are sort of symbols of luxury, like the fur coat. Um, one thing, I, this is called uh, drifters. Um, I always like to... Um, say the biggest difference between sculpture and other art forms is that sculptures exist in the world with us. Um, we have to contend with them in a different way than we do with almost any other kind of making. Um, they exist in the same space as our bodies, which is a pretty different thing than a painting, I would say. Um, this is the very first skull I did, actually, which was part of this piece, Drifters. Um, these went on to get much bigger. Uh, this is another installation shot, um, and the foreground is a, actually a video piece called School, um, which on the inside there's a video projection of myself when I was 16 talking to Desmond Tutu. Um, this is called Trickle Down Effect, another fountain piece. That brass copper um, container at the bottom is filled with pennies. It's a detail. All the birds were made out of recycled um, cut up oil jugs, or in this case, a brown tarp. And there's a bigger skull. <laughs> the skulls are kind of an homage to Georgia O'Keeffe and an FU to um, Damien Hurst. Some of you may get that, some of you may not. Um, <laughs> um, I always like to say that these pieces don't just mean something, that I want them to do something. Um, they have both of those things need to happen. Um, this is uh, called Privet. It's um, 
seven feet tall by eight feet long by two feet wide. This is at the, um, it was commissioned by the Austrian Cultural Forum, which is a cultural institution in New York um, that Austria has. <laughs> um, and they uh, have a lot of concerts and exhibitions there. It was for an exhibition called 1984. Um, there's a side view. So this is about, mm, I don't know, something like, I don't know, it's a whole bunch of broken bottles, a lot. Um, on plexiglass forms and then it glows from the inside. Um, this ironically went into a private collection in the Hamptons, um, which is filled with hedges. Um, that was actually the inspiration for the piece. Um, so there it is outside. Um, it went from inside to outside, which is another interesting thing. Um, again, I've decided to embrace this and say that it actually adds to the critique. I don't know. Um, this is a installation shot from my show Props at Zier Smith. Um, in this show, I decided to incorporate um, some performance. Uh, I'd been doing a lot of work um, with a sort of Marxist theater group in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, doing work with Theater of the Oppressed. Um, and so we actually, in addition to it being an exhibition, all of these pieces became part of a theater production. These are just individual shots from the, from the show. Um, cleats. So this is our company on the right. Um, we called ourselves the Make or Break Theater Company. And these were all people who um, actually, a mix of people who actually live in Chelsea and have lived there, including people who lived in the housing projects, along with a couple of artists and some, um, some young aspiring actors, but mostly just regular people. Um, we conducted workshops um, that's all based on Boal's Theater of the Oppressed. Um, and then we actually had a performance where, again, as you can see, everyone's standing and sitting on all the sculptures. Um, so they start to have different functions. They're not just objects to look at um, and to have distance between, but you're actually able to interact with these things. Um, I would say that themes in general, um, the social, the political, the environmental, consumption, desire, control. Um, again, these things are, I believe, inextricably intertwined in the greater world, so they are also as such in the work. And then we get to the piece that's outside. This is it on UN Plaza. Um, and the next little bit I'm going to go into is actually I'm going to show you um, a little bit of how it was constructed because it was um, kind of a crazy um, job to be done. Um, myself and three other, not that it matters, but I feel a little bit badass about it, three other female students of mine basically made this whole huge thing on the loading dock outside of my studio, um, literally running about 200 feet of extension cord down from the sixth floor and we welded the whole thing together um, with a little tiny MIG welder. Um, so this is a little brief like picture to picture of kind of where it started. Um, so there we are, that's probably like day two. We're starting to build this structure, this skeleton kind of structure underneath. Um, look, at, you can even see the MIG welder is like on a dolly because it doesn't roll anymore. Um, <laughs> We get the pieces. The pieces and parts of the replica Humvees came from a company in Utah um, that actually that's all they do is they make these replica kit Humvee shells. So like if you have a Ford F-250 and you want a military Humvee, you can just take the body of your Ford F-250 off and replace it with this and you have a Hummer. Um, so we got the, the two bodies sort of in parts and then we just almost intuitively started putting them together. I had a basic plan, um, but it sort of became a real eyeball thing at a, at a certain point, which is weird to make something this big so intuitively, but it worked out, it worked out for me. Um, so it's getting bigger, getting bigger. Um, there's Becca actually standing up on it welding. Um, there she is again. These are the guys who came to finally paint it, which we also had to do outside, which was a little challenging because in New York you're only supposed to spray paint like four ounces of paint a day outside. And I finally found this company that was like, yeah, we'll do it, whatever. I was like, okay. <laughs> and I had talked to like 20 people, so I don't know who they were paying, but they did it. Um, 
And there it is finished. And of course you can go out back and see the final thing. Um, I guess I want to also, I just want, since, since this piece, which was uh, finished in November of 2011, um, you know, the work is always sort of changing the way it looks. Um, I will say that what, what is a common thread um, is that it is always about taking these things and, and sort of stitching them together. Um, stitching things together that don't necessarily want to go together. Um, and, and I think that's kind of where the, the interest lies. Um, there always needs to be tension. Um, tension is essential. Tension between surface and form, between materials, between object and viewer. Um, the, rub, the rub is what makes us prick our ears. Um, so this is a piece that was at the Brooklyn Academy of Music um, during the presidential election. Um, and it's the United States made out of uh, recycled handbag leather and fur that was all kind of throw away from a not to be named um, luxury handbag company, um, which some of you know what it is. <laughs> um, and so, and so um, this thing hangs in midair so that you can see the front side and the back side. So the front side's very shiny veneer and sort of pretty and happy, but on the back side you can see the stitching and the raw leather and it's meant to be seen as an object um, so that you kind of can see the inside and the outside of what this thing is. Um, this is a project I did in uh, November at the New Museum, which was a sort of little mobile fish tank studio um, in the window there, um, where I was making uh, plaster casts of MREs. This was also um, a project that I decided to kind of base on the experience with Sandy. Um, meals ready to eat are what the National Guard hands out to people um, in desperate situations, and we don't have power. Um, and those are actually, I have some of those at the gallery across the street. This is from the inside, and so it was very interactive. People could come and um, talk to me and um, purchase things, and um, it was actually really fun. Um, these are a series of collages that I've been doing just to show some flat work. Um, and again, I, you know, it's like I, and I'm going to show you a video also in a minute. And even though these things are, seem like completely different forms of making, um, to me, it's actually exactly the same thing. Um, you're, you're taking these sort of disparate materials or disparate images um, and creating new context and new meaning. Um, and there's always tension, and there's like a sort of almost violence of penetration. But again, that's, that's, that's where the sort of interest and the resonance comes for me. Um, so this one is actually, I call it sunset. And it's actually, uh, that's Red Hook flooding even though it kind of looks like this beautiful seaside um, sunset kind of picture in, in the sort of orangey colors. And the bluish colors is actually an iceberg in Antarctica. Um, and this is a piece called Power Structure, um, which is, that's a dolphin that actually died in the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn um, a few weeks ago, actually. There's been all these dolphins that are swimming into New York City, which is really upsetting to me. Um, and then that's also a picture from Red Hook of a boat that just ended up on one of the streets in my neighborhood um, after the hurricane. Um, and so with that, I'm going to end my talk by showing you um, a kind of new piece that I've just done that's a video. And it's a video comprised of, that's Barack Obama before he um, became president and still had full head of black hair. Um, uh, this video um, is called Negative Space, and it's actually uh, clips that I found totally off YouTube of that my sculpture is in, because the original location um, where it was in New York is uh, across the street from the UN, and it's the official protest site for any group that wants to have any kind of protest that relates to the UN, or even otherwise sometimes. Um, so there's like about anywhere from three to five protests there a week. Um, so I figured out, wow, I can actually just like go to YouTube and search that particular protest and find all these videos that people had posted and they all have my sculpture in them, <laughs> or the ones that you'll see have my sculpture in them. Um, at the same time, and this is just sort of happenstance that I was there when this um, happened, a young girl pop group shot their video in front of the sculpture also. So this is kind of a mashup of um, 
the pop group and their song. They're called G Pal. Watch out for them. Um, and then with all of these protests. Um, so here we go. constitutions, laws and treaties to new and more far-reaching expressions of its ideals. What it represents is becoming part of man's consciousness all over the world. In commemorating this sixth anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we not only salute those who conceived, drafted and proclaimed this International Bill of Rights, we acknowledge our individual responsibility to help in realizing its aims and to follow the path to which it is a guide. Um, I should also mention that was Dag Hammarskjöld, who is the second uh, Secretary of the United Nations in the plaza where all of those protests happen, and, and the pop video and the sculpture is named after him. It's called Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza. Um, and I guess I'm going to just end with that. Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> I don't know if these are on. Is this on? Okay, excellent. 
Well, um, again, my role here is uh, really as a facilitator, as an, as an extra person sitting up here. Um, I can maybe start off the questioning while you, while you um, um, think about the questions that you would like to ask or the comments that you would like to make. And Rachel, I think that I, I'm hoping that most everybody has seen your work and maybe has had a chance to read about it. Um, but if, if people haven't, could you just, in a nutshell, talk about Talk about the ideas behind behind inveterate composition for Claire, and particularly about its its appropriateness or, or your thinking in terms of where it was going to be cited. Because this kind of moving from a from a studio artist into the public dimension seems to involve a different level of thinking. Um, you know, and I, I will have to admit that 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 location uh, sort of happened a little organically, that I actually had the idea for the piece before the site was decided upon. And when the site came up as an option, um, it seemed like the most perfect thing I'd ever heard. And then, of course, then that ended up being the site that they also wanted it, which is sort of finding each other um, kind of a thing. But um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, like I said in the talk, this idea of um, materials and content and what it becomes is so, they're all so married to each other that it's almost hard for me to talk about them separately um, because they all, like they are in a relationship with each other um, and they um, rely on each other. So, you know, if it was just military Humvees, like that wouldn't be enough. Um, they have to be scrambled into this sort of icebergy shape um, and it had to be white. Um, and then the whale songs sort of not only being adding to this sort of environmental idea, but also that whale songs sort of sound like human voices um, in a way. Uh, so it sort of has this political sort of thing, but the emotional sort of resonance of it is just as strong. Um, so it doesn't become sort of one linery um, or dogmatic, which is also really important to me. And, and I guess the reason I made the video is, is because I knew it was going to leave there. Um, and I loved what happened around it as much as I love it in a way. And that was like a little special moment for it that it'll never have again. Um, so that's part of why I made that video piece. I was leaving work yesterday and there were four businessmen, very dignified fellows, um, and they were just in mid-stride walking past the work and looking at it. Take and they just started. See the you know, obviously there's uh, there are other things going on in the square, but its mm -hmm. role in the public, you know, that kind of exhilaration, um, and that can't be something you envisioned when you were working in the studio or the roses too. I mean, how people respond to your to your work of art, where it becomes something other, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can't mm -hmm. you can't plan for that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you can either love the response or hate the response, but the response makes it, it it's part of the public realm more than something you make that goes to a collector's yeah. home that still is part of your, yeah, part yeah. of your. Well, and, and, the, and the other, I'm gonna jump in, I'm sorry, I won't be the no, only, no, no, I won't no. hog the microphone, but no. um, the, the piece that I showed of the, the performance piece in the gallery, the theater work, um, that was kind of an attempt of mine to sort of bring that publicness sort of into a more austere gallery space um, because I like this idea of going back and forth. Um, my friend Mira Shore made a comment about it and, and she said, art world, meet the real world. Because um, uh, the, the performance is a, uh, it's a, it's a um, forum performance and so the public comes and people get to ask questions and actually get to step into the plays and I really love that and I loved letting people walk all over those sculptures and sit on those sculptures even in the gallery. Um, that's sort of an important thing to me. So how was your, I mean, did you feel the same sort of surprise at the response? To With the roses? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't really, I wasn't sure what to expect. Uh, yeah. I was, um, I was, I was happy with what, see what I, what I ended up with on the street was very different than what I wanted to do. So I kind of felt like I was um, sort of half weighing it a little bit deep down. But I was very happy with, with how it was received. I think the, my whole concept about uh, changing the meaning of the global symbol got lost. But I didn't really expect uh, 
you know, I think they turned into decorative objects, which was, which was uh, not what I was attempting to do. But, but, uh, but for me, I mean, I try to, <clears throat> I try to uh, evaluate my work. Um, I don't know how to explain this, but I try to evaluate my work by how it makes me feel initially. And the thing about the roses was I didn't know. Uh, the first time I was putting them together was that night on the street when we installed it. Mm. So that was um, that was gut wrenching because I didn't. I knew the first time when I because I made them in sections because I didn't have the space to put it all together. Mm. And <clears throat> so when we when we when the crane dropped it into the into the ground. Um, and we were raising it, I was like, oh, I hope this works. <laughs> if, this, if this is At that point, awful, then to I am yeah. going to move. You know? <laughs> but, but, I, but I liked it, and um, uh, again, there was no, what my concept didn't get across, I think, ultimately, but that's okay. It's okay. I, I liked it. Well, it's kind of out of your hands. You know? Yeah, that's you what I mean. Really like, yeah. Well, I, I realize what time it is, and I realize I could have, I've got a lot more questions, but I'm not going to ask them because I know that you all would probably like to, to um, say something. You're certainly welcome to jump in. Yes? Um, well, actually, the, the um, uh, Lincoln's cabin, uh, with all its gold and appearance of luxury, actually, one doesn't have a feeling of pleasure the impressive, uh, the, the, the political um, implications by chains and shackles and arrowheads and so forth. So I think the visitor has an extremely emotional experience, but not necessarily one that's uplifting. So you did, you know, that's a completely different kind of response. Do you want to say Yeah, that? well, that's, I think that's kind of a theme in a lot of my work. There's a contradiction. On the outside, it was this gold object, this gold cabin, um, <clears throat> which for me represented, you know, the economy and what uh, the explorers came here looking for initially. And uh, when you enter into it, it's a very different feeling. Um, there's, yeah, there's, it's disturbing a little bit inside there which I intended a little bit. I wasn't really sure. I, I just, I, I, I wanted to use the, the objects as direct as possible, bullets, chains. The meaning is there. And when I arranged them all together inside, it didn't really become disturbing until I put the chains on the floor. And then it took on this whole new meaning. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I think what I'm interested in is, is contrast and contradiction between uh, what's on the outside and what's on the inside, and abstraction, realism. Yes? Um, <clears throat> um, I, I didn't really, I wasn't really thinking of that when I was making it, um, but, um, but I wanted to, I wanted to do something that, um, was pretty, in what I consider to be very direct and simple, the materials sort of form their own shapes, 
and the meaning of those materials was what was going to provoke the thought and the conversation and the questions that you have. And um, so that's, that's what I was trying to do. I wasn't specifically thinking of, of anything other than really the arc of uh, how the U U.S. economy grew to what it is now. Um, my interests, I mean, I have a lot of interests, but one of my interests is, is, and maybe it was inspired by when the economy collapsed a few years ago, because I was, you know, affected. And so I think um, uh, my interest <clears throat> really is, uh, one of my interests is how we got to be the way we are today. But I think more importantly, where it's going, because that's, that's what my, um, yeah, that's why I had the iPhones and the computer technology in there is because I, I think it's, uh, uh, we're in sort of a, an unknown uh, uh, movement that makes globalization a reality. And so things are changing very fast. And I think it's very exciting. It's scary too. It's upsetting at times. I'm not technical. I don't know how to work PowerPoint, but, I, but um, that's what I was thinking about. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was thinking you saw, I was trying to take you somewhere. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, Andrea? Um, I'll say first that the, the piece, it's um, actually that, that the first inklings of ideas for that piece um, happened in 2007, um, right as I finished that Socrates piece that I showed, the very first piece with the pipes and the um, barrels, because I, I think it was the first time I had thought about the possibility of making something that big. Um, and, and, and then it just grew and grew and grew and kind of stayed in my head. A lot of the work that you saw up there, um, the, the initial sort of seeds of it, probably came four or five years before it was ever actually made. And sometimes that's because it just takes that long um, for there to be a, a, a place for it, um, a context for it, um, someone to want me to make it. My studio's not that big, so I can't just make everything I want to make all the time and just store it. Um, so it happened, I think the beginning ideas happened right around that, that time of Socrates. Um, and as far as the recycled stuff, you know, it changes sometimes. And I always say I kind of go back and forth between um, sort of production mode and play mode. And it's really important to do both things because if I'm constantly in planning sort of um, logical thinking, making, production, then it gets real static and real boring and real dead. Um, and sometimes I just kind of have to like say, screw it, take the dog for a long walk and just pick crap up. Um, and then that kind of becomes play. And, and that's where new sort of ideas start to come from. Um, I would say I've gotten less random in my use of materials um, and, and more specific that answers the question. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I definitely, when I was making figures, I was definitely picking through dumpsters a lot more because that was part of the concept of what I was trying to do. Uh, I was quite influenced by Dubuffet with his mud faces where he, you know, was trying to make beauty out of refuse. And um, I think I, I was more coming at it from more of a psychological point. And, um, but it depends on the piece, I guess. You know, what, 
if I'm making an outdoor installation, obviously that's not, I can't because, um, um, because I just can't. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it depends on the piece. And, and I, usually, I usually try to, uh, with most of my work, I, it really is about the, the objects and the materials that are making up the sculpture. And I, I try to let the, the different objects sort of shape their own forms. Like I don't, I'm not touching it. I'm letting the object create the, the form it becomes in some instances. In some, like in the case of the bird, I, that was a manipulated. I wanted to make a bird out of nails. Um, but I think to answer your question, I think I seek out the, the uh, recycled garbage all the time. But I generally, uh, it, it does depend on the piece I'm doing and the body of work. I, I'm finding that I usually work in uh, bodies of work. It's never about one piece. Okay, we probably should uh, have time for one more question, I think. Yes? Um, well, I would say for me, it doesn't matter whether, I mean, I make stuff knowing that I want other people to see it, um, wh whether that means in a square in New York City or it means, you know, in a gallery or it means my friends coming over. Like, sorry, I'm a ham. I want people to see what I make. And I, and I enjoy that. Like, it's, that doesn't, I don't think that makes me like a, like a sellout or something. Like, um, it has tons of meaning for me, and I definitely am not completely abstract in that, and I like to kind of steer the ship a little bit. Um, but certainly every single person that comes up to anything, I don't care if it's a sculpture or a chair, they're going to perceive it based on their own experiences that they've had. <coughs> so there's only so much control you can have. Um, and I think that's awesome. I mean, that means it gets to have like 80 million different lives, you know? I think, um, yeah, <clears throat> well, I've done one public, you know, big installation on Park Avenue, and I, I, that definitely changed a lot from my, my mind to the studio maquettes that I made and the whole thing, and, and it kind of distressed me a little bit. And so when it, when it did end up on Park Avenue, it was something else, and I, and it became something other than what I had originally intended, which was fine, but it was still different. And um, um, yeah, putting the bird out this this weekend, um, which I mean, I don't know how I feel about public art. Sometimes it changes, and it does. Rachel's right; it has a completely new life once it hits the public streets. It completely takes on a whole new meaning. A whole different context. Well, there's art that you make that can go out in the public. And then there's art that you make for the public by public commission that you have to go through committees and you have to have permits. And it's, it's a different thing, isn't it? It has not been for me. In, no? my, in my personal experience, I, I was never asked to actually change any part of my piece, um, which is, is great. And I think that if I was, it would be, I probably just wouldn't do it to be real honest. Yeah. I would just say no. Yeah. So for those of you who aspire to be public artists out there, take note. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is, it, is, it is what it is. Yeah. OK, great. Well, uh, thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate your being here. We do hope that you enjoy Will and Rachel's sculptures. They're fabulous. And they'll be here for a while to come. So thank you. Thank you.